singing or music during this talk. Uh, I, I just wanted to be make sure that there was disclaimer of that. Uh, Unless yes. there are audience contributions. Okay, yeah, maybe there'll be a group singing <laughs> later. Um, so um, yeah, we're gonna tell you about a project we've been working on for a while um, on diagonal pencils and Hase bit invariant. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to start by sort of setting the stage. Um, we know a lot, or you know, number theorists like me, know a lot about elliptic curves. And people who work in string theory and physics really want to know more about Calabi-Yau threefold. And Calabi-Yau threefolds generalize elliptic curves in a nice geometric way. Um, but then in between these two, we have K3 surfaces, which are also a generalization of elliptic curves, but slightly more manageable or, or sort of simpler objects to work with. And so we just wanted to, to, to sort of set the stage for like sort of why we're working on K3 surfaces. And um, the main goal is to see if we can use classical mirror symmetry to prove arithmetic theorems. And one guiding principle is sort of see if we can generalize things that we know about elliptic curves to higher dimensions. But more generally, we want to prove arithmetic things about sort of higher dimensional varieties, but using mirror symmetry as our sort of tool um, or inspiration. And so um, here's one sort of classical fact about uh, elliptic curves. It's the Legendre family of elliptic curves um, <clears throat> defined by this equation and uh, with this parameter psi. The holomorphic form, uh, so Clavial manifolds have a unique holomorphic N form if they're dimension N. And so the holomorphic form really means the unique one. <laughs> Um, in this case is the holomorphic one form, uh, satisfy the Picard-Fuchs differential equation. Um, and over a finite field, so say we make psi an integer, um, then uh, over a finite field, the trace of Frobenius is this little a sub p, which has uh, the number of points on uh, the variety or on the elliptic curve over fp, as uh, or the FP rational points, as uh, number theorists would say, um, is, is encoding this in arithmetic information. So, or you could say that the number of points is, you know, one plus P minus A sub P, right? So um, either way, this is this A sub P is what we call the trace of Frobenius. Um, and it's related to the, to the point count. And so why, why are we mentioning the Picard-Fuchs differential equation and the number of points in the same sentence. Um, so Igusa um, sort of noticed for the Legendre family that the Picard-Fuchs equation for the holomorphic form is hypergeometric with this solution. So it's a nice power series in psi with these sort of combinatorial coefficients. I'll define these in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and the trace of Frobenius satisfies a truncated hypergeometric formula the exact same hypergeometric function, but truncated at p minus one over two times this negative one to the p minus one over two modulo p. Okay, so somehow we're getting uh, a Picard-Fuchs equation and the number of points are related to the same hypergeometric function. Okay, so this is a nice fact that Gusev found in 1958. And so then people have uh, worked on different ways of generalizing this. Um, Philip Candela, Senia de la Osa, and Fernando Rodriguez Villegas um, uh, worked on uh, thinking about this in terms of the Fermat Quintic. So Philip and Senia were already mentioned this week um, as, as people who have studied the Fermat Quintic. And then they teamed up with Fernando, who is a number theorist, to really think about this arithmetic question. Okay. And so, um, but before I tell you about what they thought about, I want to tell you sort of like where mirror symmetry comes in to play with us. And so, um, so let's say that we want to know the mirror of smooth quintics in P4. The way we do this is we start with the Fermat quintic pencil, which is this nice thing. You saw that yesterday too. Um, 
<clears throat> this principle emits a group action by roots of unity, the roots of unity, which is isomorphic to z mod 5z cubed. And then if you take the quotient of this by the group action and you resolve singularities, that's what we call the mirror. That's what Green and Plesser sort of defined as the mirror of y psi. Okay, and it has the right properties that you want for mirror symmetry, uh, things that we have not talked about. <laughs> but um, and so, and then arithmetic pattern that uh, was noticed was that when psi is an integer, then we can again do this point count over finite fields, and we see that for the uh, for x psi, the quintic, and the mirror, the point count over the finite field f q are the same mod q. Okay, so somehow the mirror and the and the quintic have sort of the same arithmetic information mod q. And so this is sort of one of the sort of guiding principles for us. Um, I have to tell you a little bit more about hy uh, generalized hypergeometric functions. So in general, we define a hypergeometric function by determining some first two natural numbers that tell us how many numerator parameters and how many denominator parameters we have. These are named that way because the numerator parameters are in the numerator. It's, uh, you get the rest. Um, and uh, these are rational numbers. These are all rational numbers. And um, this symbol means sort of the rising factorial. So you take x, x plus 1, all the way to x plus k minus 1. Or you can think of it as, as this ratio of gamma functions. Yesterday, when Tyler showed us the ratio of gamma functions like this, I was excited because I was like, that's a Bachheimer symbol, <laughs> right? So, um, so this is this this kind of thing uh, shows up in many situations, and this is why hypergeometric functions pop up a lot in these types of computations. Um, so, uh, so yeah, this is a generalized hypergeometric function. These are special functions, meaning uh, that they are. Um, Usually, special functions are either uh, sort of attached to a very interesting integral or a very interesting differential equation. In our case, this is uh, there's a differential equation that matches up that, that you can determine precisely by knowing all these parameters. Okay, and so here's what Candela Silos and Rodriguez Villegas showed: is that for the Fermat quintic and the mirror, which we already know, they have the same point count. Um, the Picard Fuchs equation for the holomorphic form is hypergeometric with this solution. So, this is a 4F3, meaning there are four numerator parameters, three denominator parameters. Um, and that the point count satisfies the corresponding hyper uh, truncated hypergeometric formula. So, we get a Nagusa type result like what we had for the, for the elliptic curves, but now for the quintic, and not just the quintic but it's mirror, right? And so then this is sort of one of the ideas of like, we want to use mirror symmetry uh, inspiration to prove arithmetic theorems, like the ones we have for classical elliptic curves. And so the question is, how do we generalize this arithmetic mirror phenomenon that we've just seen? And this is what Ursula is gonna tell you about. All right. So how should we generalize what Candelas and De Laza and Rodriguez Villegas noticed? There have been various attempts over the years. One of the people who thought about this pretty seriously for a while was Da Ching Wan, who showed that if you take the Fermat pencil, not just the pencil of Quintix, but the equivalent diagonal pencil in any dimension, and you look at its mirror, then the unit roots of the zeta function will co correspond. And if you're not a zeta functions expert, one of the consequences of that is just that the point counts will correspond on each side mod the order of the field that you're counting over. Shabnam Kadir, who was a student of Philip and Zenya's, worked specifically on a family of optics in her dissertation. It was a two-parameter family of optic Calabia threefolds in a weighted projective space. Um, you can write down the mirror of that by generalizing the green plus your mirror. And she showed that in that case, we also have a similar relationship of zeta functions and a similar uh, congruence of point counts. Um, and then she suggested that the 
method that she had used to analyze the optics should actually work in any case where you are taking the generalized mirrors of uh, maybe extended Fermat pencils to appropriate multi-parameter families in any weighted projective space that you can realize as a Gorenstein Fano projective space. Tyler. Um, so it depends on how much you trust the physics argument. She works it out very carefully for the optic family. Um, using a fairly meticulous analysis of finite field hypergeometric functions. And then she says, there's nothing special about this computation I've just done. It should work in any generality for a similar to work example. So is that a proof or is that a physics proof? <laughs> you decide. So, and then inspired by this past work, uh, Adriana and I and Tyler and Chuck Duran, who sadly is not here today, and John Voigt and Steve Sperber. In other words, a big team uh, combining number theorists and people in interested in mirror symmetry got together and thought pretty hard about what would happen if we tried to uh, push related constructions into the setting of Berglund who Kravitz mirror symmetry. Um, so we have two papers where we make a detailed study of the arithmetic of what are called invertible pencils in PN, and we're able to use BHK mirror symmetry to relate the arithmetic of seemingly very, like apparently very different pencils. Um, we have one paper where we work this out in any dimension, and then a second paper where we get into the nitty gritty and we look at different K3 uh, pencils and their hypergeometric point counts in a ton of depth. What we want to do in this current setting is I want to look at some of the similar phenomena for a set of toric varieties. In this case, the combinatorics and the algebraic geometry are going to be more intense than simply pencils and PN. On the other hand, the number theory is going to be maybe a little bit more down to earth. Uh, so hopefully, as a physics -y audience, you'll be okay with this trade-off. Um, on the other hand, if you do find yourself pining for more number theory, I would, you know, love to chat with you sometime, because I'm pretty sure that the stuff I'm going to show you today could be pushed further and could probably imply more. Right. So let's just talk a little bit about the Batarev mirror symmetry construction. Our idea is that we're going to describe mirror families of kalabi yaos using these objects called reflexive polytopes. I've got a couple on the screen here that we'll see again later. So what is a polytope? It's basically the fancy word for, oh, I make a polygon in more dimensions. Uh, so if you have a really uh, like precocious toddler and they want to move beyond blocks up into 4D, you should start handing them polytopes. Uh, we can think of the facets of a polytope as being cut out by hyperplanes, and we can nor normalize our hyperplanes as, you know, some constant times the first variable plus some constant times the second variable, blah, 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 equals C on the right-hand side. Now, let's take that k-dimensional space, and let's look at the lattice of points with integer coordinates in that space, and we'll take another copy of RK, and we've got a dual lattice, which is, we can think of as, again, uh, points with integer coordinates, but there's a natural pairing uh, given by homomorphisms from the first integer coordinates into Z. And let's suppose that we take a lattice polytope, um, in other words, a polytope that has its vertices in this integer lattice that contains the origin strictly in its interior then we can always normalize our facet equation so that the right-hand side, instead of being an arbitrary constant, is simply negative one. And if we do that, we can create another polytope. Our new polytope will have one vertex for each facet of our starting polytope. And that vertex will, will simply read off the coordinates of the vertices by taking the coefficients of our facet equations. Now, in general, if I start with something that has integer coordinates and I do this polar polytope construction, there's no particular guarantee that these A sub i's should also be integers. 
They could simply be some nice rational numbers or something like that. Uh, we, if we do find that when we take the polar polytope, we get another lattice polytope, in other words, another polytope where all of the vertices have been drip coordinates, then we say it is a reflexive polytope. And reflexive sounds like reflection, and it does that for a reason. Um, first of all, if you take the polar, the polar, you get back where you started. Um, and so we're going to say by sort of abusive ter terminology that these polytopes are a mirror pair of polytopes. So again, here's an illustration of a pair of polytopes that happen to be a mirror pair. You could sit down and work out the hyperplane equations if you feel like you need more linear algebra in your life um, and you would get back exactly the polytope on the other side. Now you can classify these things up to overall change of coordinates preserving the lattice. In dimension one, there's only one reflexive polytope. It's the line segment from negative one to one. In dimension two, there's 16 of them. Um, I'll actually show you the classification via picture in a little while. In dimension three, there's 4,319, um, which is a nice number. Uh, it means that you can really search through dimension three polytopes and try to figure stuff out. In dimension four, the classification is known, but it's kind of huge. I once asked my PhD brother, like, if he had worked with this database, and he told me, yeah, and it took, you know, a month or so to get it working and a few weeks to really search through and find everything I cared about. So searching for four-dimensional reflexive polytopes is uh, more of just, like, a, a computational size hassle. And in dimension five and up, we know lots about specific kinds of polytopes, but the complete classification of reflexive polytopes is not known. So I want to use my reflexive polytopes to build toric varieties. Um, I'm going to talk through this relatively quickly, but part of it is always like in mirror symmetry, you have to remember which side you're working on, which can be really tricky. So I want to make sure that you know the notation of which side I think I'm on when I draw a polytope. Um, so we can make a fan. Uh, and there's two ways that we can make a fan. We can just sit at the origin and take the rays through the vertices. Um, and then uh, use each facet to define a corresponding cone in Rn. Um, if you've done a lot of torque variety stuff, you may have a different way of starting with a polytope and making a fan, but that's just making the fan over the facets for the dual polytope. So I get to be a little lazy here and just do it visually. Um, and then we'll use that fan to make a toric variety. I, I, I love that so much. I wrote it twice, once in red. <laughs> um, and then an n-dimensional toric variety will be a compactification of C star to the n. All right. So here's, let's, I, we don't need to dig through all the nitty gritty, but let's at least look at the picture and think about it a little bit. Here is what I'm thinking of as the polytope that gives me P2. Well, I know that the projective plane, I make the projective plane by starting with C3, cutting out some set and modding out by an equivalence relation. To figure out which set I'm going to cut out, um, well, I would use information about the combinatorics of my polytope. Um, for the purposes of our talk today, I'm kind of more interested in the equivalence relation. Um, I can see the equivalence relation by the fact that my vertices here, I have a one zero, I have a zero one, and I have a minus one minus one. If I add those three vertices together, I get zero or the zero vector. That's the only relation that I have. And that's therefore the only equivalence relation that I need when I'm building the projective plane. If I got tired of this boring triangle and went over and looked at this fancier triangle, well, that actually also has the same uh, integer relation. If I add up uh, two comma minus one and minus one minus one and minus one comma two, I will also get zero. And that tells me that if I build the toric variety for this fancier triangle, I'll get something that looks like a finite abelian quotient of P2. Now, I really care about hypersurfaces. So we'll build hypersurfaces by starting with each lattice point in the polar polytope um, 
and choosing a corresponding parameter that will multiply by some monomial and then adding over all of the different lattice points in the polar polytope. So in general, I could have a polynomial with just arbitrary coefficients here. And just to remind you, the variables are the lattice points in our starting polytope. The monomials are the lattice points in our polar dual polytope. So if we swap perspectives about what's starting and what's polar dual, we swap perspectives about what's a lattice point and what's a monomial. Now, if I build my fan appropriately, I'm going to get a Calabi variety that might have some singularities, just building the fan the way I showed you by taking the fan over the faces. I can refine that fan to actually get a smooth thing in dimension less than or equal to four. And then if I reverse the roles of what is my starting polytope and what is my polar dual polytope, I'll get two families of hypersurfaces that are paired. And in fact, they will be mirror pairs of Calabi varieties, smooth ones for K less than or equal to four if we resolve appropriately. All right. Uh, so that was a pretty rapid tour of Badarev mirror symmetry. Is there any question anyone has about combinatorics here? I want to actually take a special pencil because if you think about what we were looking at with the Green and Plesser example, we started with all quintics in P4, but then we took a particular special pencil within all quintics, which was the Fermat pencil. I'm going to use a combinatorial trick to get a special pencil in an arbitrary toric variety from a reflexive polytope. And what I'm going to do is instead of just sticking any um, monomial, any coefficients on my monomials, I'll take the coefficients that are one on the monomials that look like vertices. And I'll take uh, some arbitrary parameter on the monomial that corresponds to the origin, which will just be the product of all of my homogeneous toric coordinates. And I'll stick zeros on every other uh, lattice point monomial. So I'm somehow just summing over all of the vertices and deforming by an origin parameter. This really does generalize the diagonal pencil in PN in the sense that if you take the polytope for PN and you run through this procedure, you'll get back the Fermat pencil again. Now, I want to talk about polytopes that are the same shape. The combinatorics word for these two polytopes have the same shape is combinatorially equivalent. So for example, here are four polytopes in R3. They're all square pyramids, and that means that they are all combinatorially equivalent. A more technical condition here, let's suppose we've got two polytopes, and they've got the same number of vertices. I could take those vertices and I could write them into some K by N matrix. And I could look at the kernel of that matrix. Um, if the kernel of that matrix is the same, and I also used combinatorially equivalent polytopes, I'm going to say that the polytopes I have are a kernel pair. The reason that I'm doing this is because the kernel of this matrix of the vertices gives me the big equivalences um, in my toric varieties construction. Let me give you a couple of examples before I give you the toric implications. Uh, the standard simplex and its polar dual in any dimension are a kernel pair. So, you know, this is not an empty definition. Uh, here's another definition just to show you it's something more than simplices. This diamond and the square in two dimensions, they both have two pairs of vertices that sum to zero. They're clearly both quadrilaterals, so they're also a kernel pair. And in fact, on this side, we would have P1 cross P1, and on this side, we'd have a quotient of P1 cross P1. Now, if I have a kernel pair of reflexive polytopes, the corresponding torque varieties are going to look like quotients of the comic torque variety. In the example we've seen, it's just like a toric variety and a, an abelian quotient of it. But it could be that in more generality, maybe you'd have two different quotients of the same thing up above. And another fact, if you've been like wishing a period would show up because mm -hmm. uh, arithmetic of periods is one of the broader themes of KAH, uh, the vertex pencils that you build in this way satisfy the same Picard Fuchs equation. So here's a question that I asked with an undergraduate student who worked with me in Wisconsin. 
um, which is if we've got two polytopes and we've they are kernel pairs and we take these generalized diagonal pencils, are we going to get some form of arithmetic mirror symmetry in, on those uh, pencils? And when we asked that question, we had some evidence. Um, our evidence was partly the green plesser mirrors for Gorenstein Fano weighted projective hypersurfaces, which um, is maybe proved, maybe not proved, depending on how you feel about Shabnam's argument, but definitely is like strongly expected to hold in this case. Um, isogenous toric elliptic curves, you can recognize are also kernel pairs. Um, and then we had computational examples evidence where we had looked at K3 surface um, examples. And since Chris Magyar was an undergrad and had written some code, he, we had just like actually counted points for very small primes. Um, and we saw that it looked like it would, might work in, the, in that case too, but we didn't have a proof. We just had computational evidence. Okay, so four years later, lots of things have happened. <laughs> um, but in order to talk about how you would do this, um, and by a less naive method than just counting the points for very small primes, we need a little bit more um, arithmetic uh, formalism. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Frobenius operator acting on our cohomology. It gives a p-linear map. And let's just work over um, fields of order p maybe for now. Or in general, the Hasevit matrix is going to be a matrix for however the Frobenius acts on your cohomology um, in some basis. Now, we call it a matrix because we could be thinking about this for like a curve which has lots of different holomorphic forms. But if we're looking at the Hasevit matrix for a Calabi Yau, well, this is just essentially the holomorphic piece of the middle cohomology. So it's a one dimensional thing. So the quote unquote Hasevit matrix is also one dimensional. We're just looking at uh, the characteristic P version of like, how does the Hasevit matrix act on the holomorphic form equivalent? Uh, now, Nick Katz uh, looked at uh, this object and observed that the number of points on a Calabi variety mod P is now going to be determined by its Hasevit matrix. So if we want to know about counting points mod P, well, one way to get our hands on counting points mod P is to start knowing things about the Hasevit matrix. Um, in particular, Katz observed that if we take the Fermat pencil of Calabi hypersurfaces and we assume um, that n plus one and our p that we're counting over are relatively prime, so we don't screw up smoothness too much. Then again, Hasevit will be given by a truncated hypergeometric series corresponding to the Picard Fuchs equation. So this is starting to feel a little bit back, um, like an interface between classical number theory and more of what the mirror symmetry folks are curious about. So we want a toric version. Um, there are a couple of toric approaches to this. Um, one is by Masha Blasenko and Spencer Block. I'm going to follow the uh, maybe, well, the more Yao school, I suppose, um, way of thinking about this, which was worked out by Cheng Long Yu in his PhD dissertation. So Huang Lian Yao and Yu, that's Cheng Long Yu, um, have a theorem where they say, let's take a Calabi Yau variety, let's realize it as a hypersurface in a toric variety. Um, and here the A sub I are the uh, coefficients of our monomials. Well, the Hasevit matrix is going to depend on the coefficients of our monomials. We can write the period integral as a Taylor series in our uh, monomial coefficients. Um, it will be a Taylor series with integer coefficients, and we can have a truncation relation on the Hasevit matrix. The Hasevit matrix will just be a truncation of the Taylor series satisfied by the periods in an appropriate normalization. Uh, we truncate the series at degree P minus one, and we take it mod P. So we want to, um, this is, this is a, a cool theorem. It sounds really exciting. Um, 
there are no examples in this paper except for the um of these toric hypersurfaces, except for the ones in PN that were already like talked about by cats. Um, so we really wanted to like do some new examples and see like what applying this theorem would tell us about actual computations. Um, so here's one lemma that you can take pull out right away um, by applying the HLYY theorem, which is that if we've got a kernel pair of polytopes and their polar duals are also a kernel pair. The simplest case is, sim is just if gamma and delta are, uh, sorry, yeah, if gamma and delta are polar duals themselves, but they might not be. Um, and we look at the corresponding vertex pencils, then for any rational psi and prime p, so that we've got smooth Calabi varieties, so we have a good idea of what the Hasevit matrix is, um, those are going to actually coincide. And then as a corollary, um, well, if we wanted to count points mod p, because that's really fun and exciting, and you can check your work by counting them for small prime, the point counts will correspond mod p if we take vertex pencils in Calabi Yao um, from kernel pairs. Well, uh, cool lemma, how often do you actually need it, right? Um, this happens in any dimension if we look at reflexive simplices and their polar duals. In other words, if we're looking at finite quotients of diagonal Calabi-Yau's and gorenstein fano weighted projective spaces. And then there are some other sporadic examples. And the next thing I wanna do is tell you a little bit more about what happens like really specifically case by case. Okay. So dimension two. Here are all of the reflexive polygons in dimension two. The way this picture works is that the vertical line is um, the polar dual correspondence. So we've seen, for instance, this pair and this pair before. Um, we can pull out the reflexive simplices. That just means we're looking for triangles in two dimensions. Um, so the triangles in two dimensions will be kernel pairs. Um, the things that are self-dual will be kernel pairs. So this hexagon is a kernel pair to itself, obviously. So is the, the upside down house a kernel pair to itself. And then the only other kernel pair in two dimensions is this diamond and its square. And that will give us P1 cross P1 elliptic curves in it and it, their mirrors. In three dimensions, we also have reflexive simplices. There are more reflexive simplices. Um, so the way this table works is on the left, I have the weights of the corresponding weighted hyper, weighted projective hypersurface. And then on the right, I have the polytope pairs that you get. So polytope zero would just give us projective space. Polytope 4311 would give us uh, the mirrors, uh, would help us generate the mirrors to cortex and weighted projective space, is sorry, in regular projective space. And then these other polytopes would give us some kind of other finite quotients, finite abelian quotients of projective space. Any questions about the beginning of this combinatorial classification? In dimension three, we also have a couple of kinds of sporadic examples, which we creatively named group one and group two. Here are the polytopes in group one and group two, and I'm gonna hand over to Adriana to tell you more about their arithmetic. Excellent, thank you. Um, I hope you were counting all of these because there's a quiz later. Um, so, so yeah, I want to tell you a little bit about sort of like illustrating the key lemma and these results for, for these examples. So we're going to focus on group one. Uh, like Ursula said, these are polar duals, but they're also kernel pairs. So sometimes we'll call these groups or sets uh, of mirror kernel pairs. Is that right? Or am I saying that in the right order? Um, <clears throat> anyway, so um, so just like Ursula told us, um, we can uh, find these vertex pencils using the vertices and then deforming by the sort of uh, the origin. And so then polytope three, this is the vertex pencil that corresponds to that. And polytope 753, it has this vertex pencil. Um, and like we saw, and like Ursula said, uh, we know uh, that these have the same Picard-Fuchs equation and they have the same point counts, right? 
And so one of the things that's cool about this is if we ever wanted to do uh, that computation of a picard fuchs equation for polytope 753, which is this mess, you actually can do it for polytope 3, which is not as much of a mess. So that's nice. And so we can do it for group one, for all the, all the things in group one, we can compute the picard fuchs equation and the point count. So I'll just show you what you get. Um, this is the picard fuchs e equation that you get. Um, and this is, after some work, equivalent to the hypergeometric differential equation satisfied by this hypergeometric function. And um, just to make sure that we match the HLYY theorem, we have to expand around the point of maximally unipotent monodromy, which really is just a, a change of variables from T to 1 over T. And we get this hypergeometric function. And then we get a nice point count, which is the number of points on any of these guys over in, in group one is going to be one plus this truncated hypergeometric function mod p. Um, and, um, and we get sort of this really nice, and actually, just so you know, we checked this. <laughs> so we plugged this into a computer and counted points naively, and this is exactly what you want. So, um, and so then what, what, what we end up with is that we can actually classify P3 surfaces by their Hasse event matrix or their uh, Picard equation as well. And so like we can, we can say exactly what happens with all mirror kernel pairs in K3, who are K3. So there are exactly 32, that was the quiz. If you counted all the uh, simplices and then the sporadic examples, that adds up to 32. <laughs> Um, and three dimensions, of which six are self-dual. The mirror kernel pairs are divided into 16 types with a common kernel. And each type is associated to vertex pencils with common picard fuchs equations. We're just sort of restating all of the, or combining all of the previous statements. Um, four of these types correspond to vertex pencils with K3 surfaces with general picard number 19. Um, if delta is a reflexive polytope of one of these four types, the Haas event variant invariant uh, satisfies a hypergeometric truncation relationship for any rational fact. Okay, so this is the this is the content of this, but what does this look like uh, specifically? Is we can classify these, and so these are the types. This is what Ursula was just saying. This polytope corresponds to P three, and all of these are quotients of P three. And, and same here, these are all um, quotients of this weighted projective space. Uh, these are all Picard rank 19. And this, these are our two sporadic uh, example groups. And so for all of these, we can find the Hasse Witt invariant mod P, and it's these truncated hypergeometric functions. So we can fully computed those. You can see this one and this one are actually the same. So, um, and so, um, so this is, well, no, this is, let, let me just show you this for a second, because this is very cool. We actually classified all of these things. This is very exciting to us. Um, and we can say exactly what the point count is for all of these um, with these formulas. And so, um, but there's another neat sort of um, geometric consequence or correspondence um, is an easy consequence of the being able to um, express these as hypergeometric functions. And so we can use our geometric and arithmetic information to relate these Picard rank 19 families um, to families of elliptic curves. So going back to this, we know a lot about elliptic curves. How can we use that to say things about other higher dimensional uh, varieties? we can relate it to families of elliptic curves parametrized by classic modular curves. So we can sort of see some modularity in there from knowing what hypergeometric uh, we have. And so um, there are two ways you can do this. Uh, one is a theorem by Chuck Duran that says that the picard fuchs equation of a family of rank 19 lattice polarized K3 surfaces can be written as a symmetric square of a second order homogeneous linear Fuchsian differential equation. So um, we didn't say this, but our families in that table are all uh, lattice polarized. And so um, <clears throat> we can all we can write all of those as symmetric square. 
But there's another way that you can do this because we know these are hypogeometric. You can use something called Clausen's formula, which tells you that if 3F2, which all of ours were 3F2 hypergeometric functions of this type, can, is the exact square of a 2F1. Okay, and these are associated with second order differential equation. So either way, um, we can do this by like finding the symmetric square root of the picard fuchs equation that I showed you for group one, and it's this. And after change of variables is this hypergeometric, uh, is the hypergeometric equation satisfied or which has solution to F1, this. And, um, and but you can also see by just using uh, this formula, that the 3F2 is exactly the square of that. So you can do it either way. Um, and so then and so then you ask a question. Well, I, the number theorists, ask a question is like, well, is this always going to be, because these are the Hasse event matrices, are these things mod P, not truncated and not mod P, they are squares. So are they actually always sort of quadratic residues, right? Um, and the answer is no, <laughs> um, sadly, <laughs> uh, only when P satisfies these divisibility conditions. So um, these, remember, are rational numbers. These are the, the hypergeometric parameters. So what this basically means is that the denominators of these rational numbers have to all divide P minus one. And then, and then you do get quadratic residues, which is nice, but it would have been nicer <laughs> the other way around. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so then you have the, for example, this uh, group one, the Hasse invariant is a quadratic residue, but only when P is one mod three, okay? And so, um, and so then what does that have to do with modular groups? Well, uh, first I'm gonna uh, review or tell you about modular groups and modular curves. Modular group is a subgroup of PSL2R and acts on the upper half plane by linear fractional transformations like this. And, uh, and then the modular curve is we take the upper half plane, we uh, mod out by gamma, and then we compactify, okay? And so um, some modular groups of interest, <laughs> we have the so-called congruent subgroups. Um, these are sort of uh, these matrices where C is congruent to zero mod n. We call that gamma naught of n. Uh, there's a map that acts on this uh, naturally called the atkin laner map. And then we, when we, when we write this uh, notation, means that we have the group generated by gamma naught of n and the atkin laner map. Um, and so then we finally get some modularity. So for group one, remember that it was related to or was the symmetric square of this uh, hypergeometric function. This hypergeometric function can be looked up in all of these sort of uh, uh, tables of the, the Harned report and the Conway and Norton Monsters Moonshine paper. And we see that this is associated to the modular group gamma naught of three plus. When it's just a plus without the thing, it means it has all of its acting linear involutions. Okay. And so so it's really cool that by this classification, we can also observe other arithmetic properties like arithmetic geometric properties, like this is associated to this modular group and this modular curve. Um, and so that is all we have. Thank you so much for being here today. And thank you to the Newton Institute for hosting us. <clears throat> Thank you. Are there any questions? So you have this sort of interesting connection between certain potential of phase threes and the spin that has elliptic curves. Is there any kind of direct geometric connection that you know of that would explain that, for example, is this, um, are these phase three 
somehow or other part of the family that comes from the corner of the Right, or like so that is fiber. true yeah. in some of the examples. For instance, um, for the formacortic, which is one of our four types, we do know that it is by the Shiota NSA construction, which is basically you take the coomer of the product, they go up to curves, and then you do a little bit of extra work. Mm -hmm. Um, we are not totally sure whether um, all of our examples are Shiota NSA. Um, I have certainly seen examples that I've looked at for other reasons of other rank 19 families of K3 surfaces where you could still pull out analytic fibration, but it wasn't a Shiota NSA. That's certainly what we'd expect is that there's some form of elliptic fibration hiding in there. Uh, well, Matt Curran's question. So to the best of my recollection, the way that um, Yao, Yu, Lian, and Huang prove their theorem is just by literally using residue theory to represent differential form, apply the Frobenius to it, and show that uh, you have this matching of the truncation of the series mod P with the Frobenius eigenvalue. So another place where you might have such a mechanism available, though I'm not completely sure, is for hypersurfaces in homogeneous varieties. And I wonder if anyone has thought about trying to prove, you know, this Hasevet equals truncation of period for hypersurface families, uh, Calabia hypersurfaces in homogeneous varieties. Wait, no, you can, yeah, oh. <laughs> Um, so we have thought about this a little bit. Um, Adriana and I have been thinking about examples in Grassmanniums, um, which would be the next natural case. That is something that HLYY think about a little bit. Um, there's a surprising normalization that you have to do. Like I think you have to pull back to a Richardson variety or something like that to make the point counts work out appropriately. Um, we do have one example, the very simplest, which would be Calabio um, hypersurfaces and Grassmannia of G24, where we are able to extract point count information by using information about the periods. As of like earlier this week, we finally managed to match everything up and we're very excited. Um, what we would need to push this further is really better technology for computing Picard Fuchs equations of uh, hypersurfaces and homogeneous varieties. For the um, G24 case, there are a couple of ways that you can try to do that. Um, but for bigger examples, which are no longer complete intersections, it's more of a mess. So Matt, if you have thoughts about how to do that in an explicit computational way, I would love to talk to you about it. Any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank the speakers again. And we meet again at a quarter past 11, uh, putting this clock. Oh, you seen the clock on? I didn't do anything to it. Maybe it just didn't.